Great relationships don't just happen. They're designed. Why leave love to chance when you can make strategic decisions in your relationship just like you do in your career? The days of settling for mediocre are over. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Join us as we explore the decisions and choices that make relationships work no matter what life throws your way. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Welcome to Project Relationship. Hi, and welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. I'm Ken Hamilton. And we are continuing to talk about shame this week. We talked about shame last week, and there was a lot about I some shame that you about were feeling. My shame that I've had and have feel, felt and feel and right. how I respond to that. And we specifically talked about shame around sex, but I noticed after the podcast that we we sort of danced around the topic a little bit. So I say this week, we go straight into the heart of the matter. We cut to the chase. Because um, we were going to talk this week about the shame that both of us have, but I, well, I'm going to speak for myself, about how our relationship started. I can. Or how this part of our relationship started. How this part of our relationship. And I will, um, yeah, you you can, you can speak for both of us there. I have lots of shame from the beginning of our, we haven't quite figured out all the words for it, but yeah, the start of this relationship this that we relationship. have. So we haven't always been married, which is normal because people are born That's right. not married. And so like everyone else, <laughs> like we haven't always else. been married. We also haven't always been married to each other. We were married to other but people. We have been married to other people. Yep. Um, we've known each other our whole lives. I'm not ashamed of that, though. I did spend a lot of my youth wanting to slap your stupid face. So that and and that's not. Um, <laughs> I don't think that's that not was... a shameful point of view. There no, were a lot of people. I think who there felt are plenty that. of people. I think there are still some people who think that way about you. I, I think, think that's that true. I think some of them are directly haters. related to me. I think you have some haters. <laughs> yep. I'm sure I have some haters too. I can live with that. But we got started having a romantic relationship at a time when we were both married to other people. And I don't feel a lot of direct shame about that. No, and we don't have time to unpack all, all of, of that, that here. <laughs> but I do feel a bunch of shame about how I, I, the ways that I was truthful, the ways that I, I tried to be truthful, and yet years later, I still had to go back and, and unpack and see all the ways that I, I, I danced around things. I didn't ask for what I wanted. It took us years to get to a spot where we had actually said all of the things I that I wish we had said yeah. right in the beginning. Yep. So here it goes. We started, well, 11 and a half years ago. Yes. Um, we, we were both working out at a gym that I had started with my first husband and you and I had been friends uh, for at least six or seven years we because our children are the same parenting and, age. Yeah. And we had been... Lived down the road from each other. Right. We'd been family friends. You had been a friend of my family mm -hmm. since I was a baby. Like, well, since before that. You knew them before I did. And our history meant that when we started working out closely and spending more time together in a less like parent-focused way... I had the opportunity to start to know you as an individual, which was very new for me. I had only ever known you as um, the friend of my cousins or the the husband of a friend of mine or as the father of a child who I had in a particular group. I was kind of a second degree yeah, connection. Yeah, you were almost always yeah. a second degree connection for me. I didn't consider myself directly connected to you in friendship, even though we had spent car rides talking together and we'd had plenty of one-on-one -on -one interaction. And I had absolutely no idea that I, there was any attraction to you in me. Just zero. I had no idea. You uh, annoyed did, the hell out of me. Yes. I did not have that. Um, that, that wasn't my uh, experience of uh, our pre-romantic relationship. 
but you played your cards very close oh yeah to I the mean, chest. um i have both regrets and shame the regrets go back to uh oh i wish i had um just per pursued more of a relationship with you whether it went anywhere or not i liked you and i liked being around you and i didn't do anything about it and this is complicated because there are also 10 years between us mm -hmm. so when i was a teenager and you were in your late 20s and already married when we might yeah. have noticed uh, noticed each other the first time around yeah. um and then i got married very young mm -hmm. um i was 20 when i got married the first time yeah, I can see why we didn't. My father, before he died, he would ask me at least like once every few months, why didn't the two of you figure this out before? Like, you know, I have no answer for that, Dad. There's no answer. It, There was no us until all of a sudden there was. Yeah. And for me, that happened um, actually a, a little bit after it happened for you. Yeah. But you knew that there was attraction kicking around yeah. under the surface. And... Um, I just didn't, I, I think I thought of you as a grown up, and I still thought of myself as one of the kids. <laughs> That's part of the problem. But one of the things I don't feel shame about is that when we were out dancing, we were out celebrating, we were at a bar with a sticky floor and we were just all really hanging sticky. out with other friends and we were just dancing. When that, ha when, when we were dancing and I all of a sudden felt the shock wave of, Oh my God, I am utterly compelled by you. While it was shocking to me, I didn't keep it a secret. I, I told people, right. I told my friends, I told your wife, I told my husband, <laughs> I told people because it, I have this sort of, um, yeah, compulsion to tell the truth. I, I really dislike lies of omission they make me feel itchy and gross. So I told everybody, and this was a, I was not terribly well received everywhere. It was, However, it, was not. it wasn't entirely poorly received either. Lots of people were shocked, um, but your wife was actually not shocked and was very welcoming to me. Yep. And um, shared how the two of you really hadn't had a monogamous relationship. So she didn't mind. It wasn't a problem for her. That was what she told me. And that was a revelation to me. I had never even considered non-monogamy. It just didn't exist in my worldview. But it is one of those things that once you know about it, it's hard to unknow about it. Yeah, it, at, at least for me, uh, once once the idea was there. And I had I had precedent before we got together. Um, yeah, there was our relationship, mine with my first wife. Um, she had already had a relationship with somebody else. And it was, it wasn't something we talked about a lot, but it was something we did acknowledge. We, like it, we didn't, it wasn't hidden. So you didn't keep secrets. We didn't and it keep had the been secret, but we didn't dig into it at all, <laughs> which was a So mistake. you didn't do it the way you and I no. are doing it now. Right. There and... was no, there was no podcast about it. Okay, for there was example. no podcast about it. But even <laughs> even before there was a podcast, we have yeah. had a lot of explicit conversations yeah. right from day one. Yep. And so I go back to that beginning, and I think since I was honest, which is a deeply held value for me, and since I was um, uh, trusting, I was trusting that people were showing up and saying their truth. I don't know why, but my God, is there still a lot of shame? around that time and it is overwhelming at times i like so 11 years later and i can still be knocked off my feet yeah well, by the profound level of shame that comes with having been well i mean i was called a house wrecker i was called a i was called um the other woman i was called lots of things and all of those accusations from the outside none of which came from you or from your wife? No. Um, um, you were both actually quite kind to me throughout the early stages, especially. Um, but the accusations that came from the outside and the whisper campaign mm -hmm. on the outside was very challenging. Yeah. And I think it took root. It like it it rooted itself in me, and I have been have been hoping all this time that it would just sort of wither over time. And we started talking about shame last week, and I thought. Well, I should probably talk about this because yeah. 
no amount of honesty has actually made it totally go away. And I don't feel guilty, but boy, oh boy, the shame piece, the piece that says I'm a bad person because this is my life story versus even I've done a bad thing. That would be different. You just said something. So the last time we talked about shame and secrecy, uh, that, that came up in the link. Yeah. And you just said the whisper campaign. And how yes. much do you think the the secrets that were withheld from you about in, in your community, in the people who were supposedly your friends, they withheld their judgment from you? It, it so was there confusing. Was some secrecy, do you think? There, maybe there was that? a lot of secrecy. So there were there was secrecy in at least three places that seemed to matter a lot, at least in retrospect. One was that um, while while your wife was totally fine and and had was was encouraging me to pursue a relationship with you, she didn't want me to be public facing about it. Right. Um, and that sort of came out in, in I didn't know that all at once. It, it, that came out in like little tidbits. And so I kept having to change my behavior and try to figure out how to be suitable. That was challenging. Um, another was that my own mother um, was struggling with it. And she was struggling with just acknowledging the truth of the relationship that I was saying was there. Um, and it wasn't just my mom, but I think my mom was the one I cared about the most. So yeah, there were other people, sure. part of my parts of my family, who definitely were judging from the outside and saying some pretty harsh things about what they were seeing about us having what people kept calling an affair, mm -hmm. even though we were openly talking about it and yeah. talking about it in the framework of non-monogamy, like intentionally. We didn't have the word polyamory yet. We didn't have, we really didn't even have the words consent, consensual non-monogamy, but, but the framework was there, the talking about the honesty and the fact that there, there didn't need to be a, a prohibit, a, a prohibitive kind of intimacy, but there were a lot of people who needed me to not talk about it. And, um, so the third place where the secrecy showed up was, um, in all of my friendships people, the people who I thought were very, very close friends, very close friends, they did not want to hear about this. And when they did, they had so many judgments. And I kept taking in those judgments and hearing them and trying to counter argue them. But you can't counter argue your way out of somebody else's deeply held values. Right. And I, all of that sort of created a yeah, like a rich, fertile ground for the shame to take root, for sure. That's what we were talking about last yeah. year, last week. And so, yeah, the secrecy and the need to have things be secret definitely impacted me. And I didn't realize that that's what was happening. Because up front, at the very beginning, it was, we're just going to talk about this. It'll be totally open. It'll be fine. And uh, after my husband filed for divorce... I was asked to keep more things secret than as our relationship intensified. I was asked by your wife to keep things even more secret. And then as the summer went on, so we were coming up onto a year, I was asked to withdraw even further and, and to still, I was living with you at that point, but I was asked to um, never not touch you anywhere, like yeah. even hold your hand or touch you or look yeah. at you. And I was asked to keep the whole thing um, quiet. And I, I, and it was, it has created in me this tangle. I now understand that I, I wasn't on a level playing field. I didn't actually get to negotiate what I felt was an appropriate amount of intimacy or, or yeah. an agreement or anything. And the relationship that I had with my first wife was one that was, it, there wasn't explicit conversation about, um, well, much of anything psychological there were there were there weren't any psychological explicit conversations and so when you came along there was so much that if if um for things to go well there was going to need to be those explicit open conversations and and that's one aspect but the other is yeah without the explicitness it felt okay to just hide things 
because that's how things go. We don't talk directly about them. We let them be implicit. We let them be under the surface and guessed at and never looked directly at. And then you came in and sort of became one of those things. And this is, I mean, this got to produce some shame. I did feel oh, And so, you know, then my shame comes up. For I didn't know that that's what it felt that. like at first, but right. I, but I hear what you're saying and that, that these are things we don't talk about. Yeah. And yeah. I did. I felt like a thing. And I felt like a thing we don't talk about. And, and I'm not talking about for like a couple weeks. No, I mean, we're talking about long time. years. Yeah. We're talking about over two years yeah. of time. Um, the first 18 months of which were explicitly like my, what I was allowed to do was very tightly controlled. Yeah. And I made the mistake of thinking that my honesty would somehow free me from those things. And, but that the mistake I made was that I, I presumed, <laughs> I, I assumed I made an ass out of you and me. I assumed that the kind of conversations you and I were having, um, and that I was having with your wife, I assumed that the two of you were having those kinds mm. of conversations too, because she was having them with me and we were, our friendship actually was deepening for the first year. Um, but she and I didn't do that. Yeah. Not. And I didn't know that. Ever. And I actually couldn't even believe it. I'd kept banging my head against that. I couldn't imagine that, that you weren't having these conversations. And so you would tell me how you thought things were going when we would have private time, but it wasn't, it was never the whole picture because it yeah. turned out that there wasn't a whole picture. Nobody was holding the whole picture right. all in one place. And I've heard a phrase, <laughs> what I think of now is funny, but if you're in this place right now, just know I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing with you because I have stood in this space, but um, something that gets talked about if you, if you wind up being a unicorn, a, uh, a bisexual female in a in a complicated um, heterosexual looking relationship. That's the term for unicorn. If you wind up in that spot and you stick around and you're really committed to the people, it is definitely possible that you're going to wind up being a divorce doula. <laughs> a divorce doula, a divorce yeah. Doula. And that is what it felt like for me. I didn't know that that's what I was getting into, but my commitment to you kept deepening and her resentment of me kept deepening. Yeah. And yeah, it just became this sort of untenable mess. And you know, at one point I was asked not to, not to speak to her, but we were living in the same house and it was really, really messy. And you were expected by the, the two of us, the married people to adjust to whatever the marriage needed. And so this is another important concept yeah. about consensual non-monogamy because couples mm -hmm. privilege is a real thing. And now here you and I are in a consensually non-monogamous marriage yeah. and it is really a challenge to remember that couples privilege manifests in a, a billion little ways yep. where you treat the marriage as an autonomous thing, as a, as, as its own primacy it has yeah. it has its its own rights and privileges I'm, and and those can really hurt other people especially if they're implicit and they're not explicit uh, i don't have yeah. an argument against the idea of hierarchies in relationships um per se because it's not for me to say how people should have relationships and you and i have made a commitment to say not have somebody else um Ex, you know, come and live here while we're while we're raising a, our younger family, and um, so I get the purpose of hierarchies, but the unspoken hierarchy, yeah, yes, made me so conf I was so confused all the time because I kept hearing from you and from her, and I kept participating in this idea that we were three adults having relationships and that we had we had equality. Yeah. And, and I yet, remember that, that that time and how it felt to be having those conversations and to make that claim. And it's what I wanted to be true. It was absolutely not true, but it's what I wanted to be true. And I don't say this to defend myself. I say that to sort of say um, where I was coming from. It's like, well, if if I if I say that, maybe it'll become true. 
No, not with the things that we did. Um, the the imp- not with the things we didn't do. I didn't talk to my first wife in any kind of significant way about what we were doing and what the future was likely to be and what the present felt like. Uh, topics that now feel ridiculous not to have had, but that wasn't the relationship that she and I had. You and I have that kind of relationship and I would never go back. Well, born in part out of mis- the mistakes. Yeah. That's one of the things that saves me from this shame being totally, because I, I do, I still feel the weight of it all the time. I feel the weight of the, the scarlet letter thing, the, the, um, having been this other woman all the time, which is ironic because my marriage broke up first and nobody called you a homewrecker. No. No one. Nobody ever. Ever. And not even not even my first husband, who was, who was very, very angry at me, but honestly did not. He was not angry at you. And I actually think that that was rightly so. I had made him a promise and then I didn't keep it. Yeah, I didn't promise so him anything. So I don't have a problem with the fact that he was angry with me or may still be angry with me. That's, that is his anger to have. And... Um, I, yeah, I honor the fact that, yeah, I did. I, I changed the rules. I, 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 I left. I, I get that, but <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I don't know. I didn't see it coming to have so much be undercover yeah. and not talked about. And so the shame that, that brews around in me is around having been supposedly the destroyer of your real family. Right. Is, when... is one of the things that, do you feel shame about this? Um, so you watched, she and I have our relationship from the outside. There's our marriage. And apparently everybody was saying, well, look at them. They're doing great. And then you came and lived with us and saw what day-to-day life was like, all the minutes of the day. Yeah. And uh, it was not... It Perfect. Was, we did not have things in uh, in hand. It was. Well, it was not the happy marriage that no, everybody seemed to think wasn't. it was. And do you take on any responsibility for the? So there was your image of what you thought we were, and then you saw what we actually were. Do you hold any responsibility for maybe like having imagined making it that way? Okay, I think I'm. I think I have processed and set down the idea that I made it that way. I mean, it's been a decade, so I've had time to process. Mm -hmm. However, I still hear people who knew you two when who tell me, but they were so happy. And I have to sit with the, but you didn't, you know what? You, you don't actually know that. What you know is what they looked like at parties or what they told you or whatever, but nobody nobody ever knows any marriage. Like, unless you're on the inside of it, you really never know. And yep. so I was invited to come live inside of it. And I do feel, I feel a lot of responsibility for having made you aware of what, what you were actually doing. I, whatever she was doing set aside, I feel aware of me making you like aware of, of bringing to your attention the fact that you you know, for instance, liked sex and weren't having any for years. I feel responsible for making it clear to you that you frowned all the time so much that your the lines in your face were like carved and you found a smile. And I, I pointed these things out and I don't mean just like, oh, I made you happy. I do not mean that. No. I mean, I literally pointed no. these things out. Yep. If you didn't want to be with me, I at least was hoping that you would decide to smile like with your eyes and everything and that you would decide to be alive. We stood in a kitchen one time and you honest to God told me and her that if you got sick, you would just walk out into the woods to die alone. And that sounded reasonable to you. Yes. Yes, it did. And you looked at me like I was crazy when I like, I think I had one of those moments where like a single tear rolled down my cheek. It was very like, I can't believe he's saying this because I, you so clearly meant it. You so clearly did not have a sense of being attached to anything. Right. And I, yeah, I, I felt, 
I felt the the reality of what was happening as like the ice was thawing around you because yeah. because years go by and years go by and we started have our having a, a real relationship where we had real conversations and I I watched your smile come back. You are my lovely other dinosaur. Oh. And you thawed out. And yep. people who know you now know you as somebody who wears a unicorn hat all over the place and giggles at the slightest and is so ticklish and ridiculous. You're you're a silly, funny, gentle, kind person. And this is what I don't get. The, the pressure on you, the um, if shame can be put on someone, the shame that was put on you for taking the position of, of coming to me, of, of taking care of me, of caring about me, of saying, you're not happy. Like you said earlier, Hey, you've got this frown, find something that makes you smile. If it's not me, fine, but find something you cared about me that much. And the, why anyone would shame you for caring about, and not just me, because you did what you could for her too. I hope I, I hope I did. I don't that's know what it whether, looked like to me. I, I mean, it, that's for her to say, that's for her to say. but I, I know, know I, I did, I benefited hugely and yes, the, the ice thawed and now I can laugh and it, um, and I feel a lot of shame for having for my part of that situation that has left you in that, um, with your feelings of shame? Well, I, f I feel them and I know I, I'm working with it all the time and I've worked on it with two different analysts and a couple of therapists. And one of the things I'm left with is the reality that my work, everything that I've built, everything I've studied, it is all rooted in the pain of making my relationships really, really, really transparent, making it clear to me what was actually going on, having incredibly challenging conversations and, and making really big messes. I say all the time, like I threw my life into the wood chipper and just thought, oh, it'll be fine. I don't know why I decided to trust that it would be fine, but I do know that I would not be who I am now if I had done it differently or if you or anybody else who was involved had had behaved differently yeah. i wouldn't have had this experience there are things that i i don't regret i just wow i wish those didn't happen like i wouldn't wish them on anyone but mostly this is our story this it's not all of the story it is our story this is part but of it this is the story and this is how we have seven teenagers and a messy life and complications galore and a very finely tuned sense of how rough things can get if you don't explicitly talk about them. Right. And years of practice of getting deeper and deeper in those conversations that we have with each other. Yeah. Um, without which I don't know how we would manage all the complexity of everything that's going on now and our history. Yeah. Sometimes I think, how did we make it through that and actually wind up in love and more than in love committed to figuring out how to live a life together where we increase our intimacy. Yeah. Not despite of those mistakes, yeah. but because of them. Yep. Being able to be loved by you and visible to you and seen this way is the most valuable emotional experience I can imagine. And learning how to love you after some pretty difficult, um, dare I say, you know, traumatic or, or whatever experiences, learning how to do that is, is primary to my becoming who I want to be in this world. So I don't regret it. I just, um, well, I've always said I had to talk about it out loud. I have to actually share this story because it's part of my life. So here it is. I do feel some shame over it, but I mostly feel like here it is messy. It has been messy. It will be messy again. So that's my, my shame story for this week. 
I'm going to pick up next week with something much more fun, much more entertaining. Um, and yeah, I think we'll just leave that for next week. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Project Relationship Podcast with Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And Ken Hamilton. If you're enjoying our conversation, we would be so grateful if you would drop a rating and quick review so more people will be able to find us. And if you have questions or suggestions that you of things you'd like us to tackle, please send an email to Jolie at JolieHamilton.com. I'd love to hear them. Project Relationship, the Entrepreneur's Action Plan for Passionate, Sustainable Love, is available on Amazon in Kindle, soft, or hardcover versions. This book is a succinct, practical guide to improving your love life. I wrote Project Relationship to give you a set of quick action tools and conversation guides that can transform a mediocre relationship into a fabulous one. These tools are based not just on what Jolie learned in her studies, but on what we actually do to make our relationship thrive. Until next time, remember, relationships can be messy, and that's good news.